All right, good afternoon. Uh, we're sh changing things up a little bit here. Uh, we'll have uh, Mr. Lacroix go first, and then we'll do the regular briefing. So, uh, Jean-Pierre, welcome to the briefing, and go, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stefan, and uh, good afternoon, all of you. I just um, wanted to brief you on the, the Cruz report. You're familiar with the report uh, and uh, uh, what uh, we are doing to implement these recommendations. Um, so I would like to start by uh, where we're coming from. Uh, where we're coming from is that uh, last year the number of fatalities in peacekeeping has doubled compared with the previous years, and the previous year numbers were already higher than before. So we have to reverse that. We have to change that. And this is why we asked General Cruz to uh, work on the issue, how to reduce fatalities in peacekeeping. Uh, General Cruz is a very uh, respected and highly esteemed uh, former force commander in, uh, in the DRC in Monusco and in Haiti. And uh, he uh, uh, came up with a, with a report which is uh, very candid, very blunt uh, to all of you and we, we welcome to all of us. And, uh, and we welcome that. This is exactly what we expected from uh, General Cruz, uh, a very, very candid uh, assessment of uh, what uh, the problems are, what we should do in order to reduce the number of fatalities in peacekeeping. Um, so now we um, are beginning to implement the, uh, uh, the, re the recommendations based on the report. We uh, have a plan of action that we uh, uh, circulated to, uh, to all of you. And uh, uh, what I would like to, to underline is uh, uh, the Cruz report and the, uh, the action plan uh, that uh, we will uh, implement. Uh, uh, they're about reducing fatalities in peacekeeping, but they touch most issues that are relevant to performance. Uh, they address issues such as, uh, uh, are we implementing our own rules, uh, even down to the basic levels? Are we playing by our own book? Do we have uh, uh, the training that we need at every level before deploying and in mission? Um, do we have uh, uh, the right kind of equipment uh, to better protect ourselves and, and also better protect the population we're serving? Do we have the right mindset? Do we understand fully what our robust mandates mean? And uh, are we ready to fully implement these mandates um, at all level in our mission and here at HQ? Um, and do we have uh, the right kind of leadership? And uh, what do we do to make sure that uh, uh, leadership is, uh, is tailored and adequate to these difficult missions? So these are the hard questions that the uh, uh, Cruz report addresses. And as I say, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's a tough report, but peacekeeping is a tough business as well. And uh, uh, we all uh, decided that hard truths had to be told. Now, um, you have the action plan. We already began to uh, uh, implement uh, some of the measures. Um, and I would like to underline that uh, the action plan is, uh, is very much based on uh, regular monitoring of the implementation. We have monitoring teams in uh, our five biggest missions. We also have a implementation support team here at HQ. And moving forward, we will be interacting uh, constantly with our colleagues in the field uh, and also here with member states uh, to uh, move forward in the implementation. So what this action plan is about? Um, short term is um, make sure that uh, we do what we need to do, what we have to do, and we can do within our existing resources. And it can be very basic things that, uh, uh, you know, at sort of basic unit levels have to be done. We have to make sure that they're done so that we increase our protection and increase our performance. Um, it also has to do with um, uh, identifying in the short term, identifying the needs more precisely. What are the needs in terms of training? What are the needs in terms of uh, equipment? Um, how uh, are, are we doing right uh, in terms of uh, pre-deployment visits? In other words, uh, are we uh, good enough in terms of uh, assessing the units that will be deployed and uh, 
and uh, uh, you know whether they're up to standards or not. Um, and uh, the other thing that we want to do uh, short term immediately is to uh, improve uh, risk assessment. That's what we have mandated our uh, colleagues in the field to, to do immediately. Uh, and then moving forward, we will have to, uh, uh, based on the uh, uh, needs assessment, uh, determine how to respond to these needs um, in terms of training. I think there uh, is a major effort that we have to, to, to make in terms of uh, improving training. As I said, both prior to deployment, but also in mission training, which is something that we don't do enough, and we need to do that more because uh, our colleagues have to be more familiarized with the environment in which they will be operating. Uh, we need to, um, um, you know, short, um, mid, rather mid-term, um, adjust our uh, methods. In other words, uh, make sure that uh, we. Um, um, have a better way of uh, uh, anticipating threats, uh, uh, a better ability to respond to these threats uh, rapidly. Uh, and it's a question of uh, um, equipment, it's a question of mindset, it's a question of procedures. Uh, so based on these short-term assessments, we, we want to move in adjusting our methods. And we want to uh, address issues of performance, uh, both in terms of unit performance, leadership performance, um, and um, if needed, uh, work on these and, uh, and uh, uh, try to redress situations that are not satisfactory. Uh, of course, closely working with our true contributing countries, our police contributing countries. And the last thing, um, which also is addressed by the Cruz report uh, uh, and uh, on which we will be working on perhaps more uh, within the uh, strategic reviews that we're undertaking for our mission is to look at how, how mission are configured. In other words, um, are we, do we have the right deployment uh, within our resources? Are we, uh, aren't we in some cases overexposed? Um, shouldn't we uh, revisit uh, deployments and how missions are organized and configured. And this is something that uh, uh, is uh, of a sort of a higher strategic level and uh, something that we'll do on uh, within strategic reviews. Uh, so this is our plan. Um, it's, um, as I said, the, the cruise report is about reducing fatalities, but uh, uh, if we do it right, we will not only be able to reduce the number of fatalities, we will potentially be able also to improve our overall performance and, 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 and therefore also better protect our, uh, the population we're serving. Um, it's a collective effort, um, and I think the overall efforts that we're making to try to improve peacekeeping effectiveness uh, has to be understood as a collective effort. Uh, we have our own responsibilities. There are a number of things that we have to do, and we'll do our best to do them and to monitor their implementation. But at the same time, uh, it is also a responsibility that we share with member states in their different capacities. <coughs> troop contributing countries, police troop contributing countries, um, members of the Security Council who are giving us our mandate, financial contributors. Um, and I've been interacting with all of them uh, in the past days, and I will continue regularly interacting with them. So uh, this is what I wanted to, to tell you. Uh, performance is peacekeeping is not a new issue, and uh, I think it would be uh, unfair to say that nothing has been done so far, but at the same time, uh, the challenges have changed dramatically, and this is reflected by this high number of, ca of casualties. So. Uh, we all felt, and the Secretary General felt, that we have to take it to a different level in terms of our responses to these. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to responding to your questions. Thank you. Sherwin. USG, welcome back to uh, the press briefing room right in the front here. Right on behalf of Hello. the UN Correspondents Association, good to see you and thank you for this. My name is Sherwin Bryceby, South African Broadcasting. The sense I get from this report is that the posture of peacekeeping needs to change, right? Better training, better readiness, better political will, better equipment, better intelligence, better procedures. What's 
to stop us from saying that peacekeeping essentially needs to become a massive force inter intervention brigade, similar to what we have in the DRC. Mm. I mean, are we crossing <clears throat> the line here in terms of being, if you want the peacekeeping to be more proactive, uh, is, is the very nature of peacekeeping then un under change? You know, I think the objectives are um, the same. Uh, we have to look at our mandate. Our mandate is about protecting civilians, about protecting population. It's about supporting peace efforts. So it's the rationale of peacekeeping. But what has changed is the environment in which we're working, and the fact that uh, we're being attacked by armed groups who are uh, looting, killing, raping, uh, and they have no interest in peaceful solution. Um, so it's because we have this very different dangerous environment that we have to change. And you know, we have robust mandates, so we, we have mandates that enable us to respond to these challenges. But uh, we, we're not doing well enough in terms of uh, implementing these mandates. And as a result of that, we have more fatalities and we uh, uh, don't protect civilians as well as we should. Thank you. Michelle? Thank you, USG. Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Um, I have a, you mentioned protection of civilians. I have a, a question about DRC. Um, on the weekend, there was more protests. Um, six or seven people were killed, according to reports. There were photos of uh, UN peacekeepers there, sort of at the protest. I'm not sure protecting the protesters, what their role was. But how far are UN peacekeepers UN peacekeepers willing and able to go to protect civilians in DRC against um, attacks from government troops? What's the situation there? Yes, first of all, we, um, as you know, uh, condemn the uh, uh, civilian casualties, uh, uh, both on, from the incident on the 31st of December, the recent incidents, and the our strong message to the authorities was that uh, those who are responsible for violations of human rights have to be held accountable. And we're repeating this message. Um, we have a mandate in DRC uh, that includes helping create environment uh, that would enable free and fair elections. And, and we can't do that if we have uh, um, a climate of uh, pressure on the uh, freedom of expression, freedom of demonstration. So this is the message that we are conveying to the uh, DRC authorities. What about, the, what about the use of... Sorry, what about the use of force by peacekeepers against government troops if they find themselves in a situation like Sunday where allegedly protesters were killed by government troops? Um, MONUSCO was uh, actually deployed in, uh, uh, particularly in Kinshasa, where uh, some of the incidents occur. As you know, I mean, we have limited um, means in, in terms of size of the country, size of, uh, of the city. Uh, but certainly, MONUSCO played a role in terms of, uh, um, I would say, uh, reducing or minimizing, diffusing tensions. Um, you know, what is more important in such cases is uh, to uh, impress upon uh, all parties, actually, particularly the uh, DRC authorities, that uh, you know, they have committed to holding election. They have committed to a timetable, and they need to create the conditions that will allow, that will enable uh, uh, these elections to take place in, in a propitious environment. Edie? What? I'll come right back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. LaCroix. Edith Lederer from the Associated Press. Uh, following up on Sherwin and uh, what Michelle said, um, Santos Cruz's uh, main point was that uh, UN peacekeepers are being killed as a result of inaction. Uh, and that they should be more active and should not be afraid to use force. Um, is this a posture that you are going to be pushing for all 
UN peacekeeping missions in the future? And what kind of a response um, have you been hearing from troop contributing countries? We have, uh, in these big missions um, in, in Africa, we have robust mandates there, chapter seven mandates there, uh, enable us to use force to protect the population and to defend our mandate. What does that mean, defend our mandate? It, it means defending uh, the support, the, the promotion of, of political efforts. And, and in front of us, we have uh, armed groups that are both after the population, but also after the peace efforts. So we're not waging war. Uh, we're not an army where uh, we have military and police, but we're not waging war. This is peacekeeping, even though it can be peacekeeping in a very challenging, difficult environment. Peace enforcement uh, is not for UN peacekeeping. It is for other form of uh, forces or of intervention. So I think that's very clear. But at the same time, we cannot ignore that uh, uh, where we are deployed, we have this uh, very dangerous environment, these people who are after us. Um, I think the Cruz report mentions um, a number of uh, improvement that we have to generate. Um, some of them has to do with more being more proactive, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, we also have to uh, better understand our environment, what are the threats to better anticipate them. Um, we have to uh, make sure that uh, there is cohesion throughout the chain of command. Uh, we have good leadership, uh, that we implement uh, the mandate evenly, that we better protect ourselves in the first place. Uh, so there is a combination of uh, measures, but I think the, uh, what the Cruz report says is uh, if we want to perform well in peacekeeping in this new environment, then there are a number of things that we, on which we have to work on. And what about the reaction from troop contributing countries. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I spoke to uh, troop contributing countries and, uh, and, and also to uh, uh, the, uh, the group of member states uh, who are involved in issue related to peacekeeping, the so-called uh, C-34, for, for, for those of you who, who know what this acronym means, and, and also to members of the Security Council. Um, and I think the reaction has been uh, positive. Um, I think everybody understands that uh, we cannot go on having such a high number of fatalities. It's just impossible. Uh, it's, we have a responsibility to uh, do everything so that our colleagues will be protected. Uh, and we share that responsibility with our troop contributing country and police contributing country. So I felt that uh, there was um, a willingness to engage, a willingness to work collaboratively uh, with us uh, to make that happen. Um, and. Um, you know, the only th the, the other thing that I would like to say is uh, it's not us and them, TCC, true contributing country and police contributing countries. You know, if if uh, if a unit is not performing somewhere, if a, if a commander is not performing, ultimately it's it's our responsibility. Uh, so it, it is very much in that spirit that uh, we are engaging with them. You know, it's only through this collective work that we will. Uh, make things better. Carol, then Joe. Mr. Lacroix, I'm Carol Landry with Agence France Presse. I basically had the same question as Michelle on DR Congo. Um, basically, uh, in MONUSCO, are you reviewing, are you thinking about, is there any contingency planning given the what has happened with the last demonstrations? You said you're uh, trying to impress upon all the parties that they shouldn't kill protesters. But beyond that, um, is MONUSCO thinking about what should be done to protect lives? In, uh, in the DRC, we, uh, first of all, we, we have conducted a strategic review that aims at uh, uh, improving our ability to protect civilians. And as you know, uh, it's about uh, enabling the force to be more mobile, more reactive. And you know, these are not empty words. It means that uh, we, uh, as opposed to having sort of larger static units, we, we, we have to have units that are better able to, to move where 
threats to civilian emerge. Um, and I'm not talking only about mil the, the, our military colleagues, also about police and civilian, because protecting civilian is, is, has to involve all these uh, components of peacekeeping. Um, so that's uh, number one. Um, as a result of that, we recently uh, closed some uh, bases, particularly in the uh, Itori region in northeast. Uh, that was because we were sort of reconfiguring uh, MONUSCO. Now, another thing is um, we have, uh, as per our mandate, uh, uh, um, cooperation with uh, both security forces and, and the military, the FARDC. But we made it very clear that, uh, and because we're acting in support of the Congolese uh, people, we, we're, and we're acting by definition in cooperation with, uh, with the authorities of the country where we are deployed. At the same time, um, this collaboration, this work, this collective work can uh, occur only if uh, there is respect for uh, human rights uh, and uh, uh, basic international human law on, uh, on the other side. And, and we recently told, I guess it was a couple of months, the Security Council that, uh, and it, I think it was also in the report of the strategic review, that we would be uh, um, sort of revising, and probably uh, we are revising downward this cooperation, because it can only happen if we have the proper vetting of the units with whom we are cooperating, if we have insurances that uh, we will be working with troops that are uh, respecting human rights. So, yes, it's a challenge, and we're taking this very, very seriously. Yeah. Joe, then Frank. Uh, yeah, Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press. Um, it has been suggested uh, for quite some time that more uh, delegation of tactical decisions uh, be given to the field, the field commanders. It was one of the problems alleged going all the way back to Rwanda, that everything's had to go back to headquarters. So I'm wondering if you can speak to that specifically. And secondly, um, are you making any contingency plans in the event that the Trump administration decides to um, follow through with uh, statements it's made in the past to reduce its percentage of the uh, peacekeeping budget from 28% to 25%? Thank you. <clears throat> I think on your first question, what we need is uh, to have a cohesive functioning uh, chain of command. And uh, in some cases it works relatively well, in other cases it doesn't work well. And uh, what we have to do is make sure that uh, at every level we have cohesiveness and, and we act evenly, we react evenly to the same challenges depending on you know, whether they occur here or there. And, and this is where we have to work on, on leadership, we have to work on organization as well. We regularly tell the uh, troop contributing countries that we need more qualified staff officers. And what, that, what does that mean? It means that we need to have more qualified people to ensure that uh, uh, staffs, headquarters staffs, uh, regional staffs, uh, share the same understanding of the mission, share the same understanding how to react to challenges and so on and so forth. And it has to do with training as well, uh, improvement of training. Now, on the, your number two question, um, we uh, take very seriously our responsibility to use our resources as effectively as possible. And uh, there are a number of initiatives that were taken, by the way, uh, on one of them, which is about air assets. Uh, I don't know exactly the figures, but uh, we have been uh, uh, reaching beyond our objectives in terms of saving on the use of uh, air assets. Um, so it's our responsibility to, to do that, and, and we want to continue. And I think it's especially true uh, as we have to make sure that we allocate uh, what is needed to ensure the safety and protection of our peacekeepers. Um, so, um, you know, that's what I have to say. At the same time, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we have uh, uh, no... Um, indication of uh, uh, further uh, reduction. I think the, uh, the, the legislative bodies, uh, Fifth Committee and General Assembly, will be uh, shortly uh, beginning the process of, uh, of um, 
looking at uh, peacekeeping budgets for the, for the next year, and uh, and we're preparing for that with the member states. Frank. Uh, yeah. Hi, Frank Uciardo, TRT World. I want to ask you a question in terms of the report about rules of engagement. If I'm a UN peacekeeper and somebody's pointing a gun at me, do I have to wait to be shot before I react? No, we have, I mean, I don't want to speak generally uh, because uh, they are obviously deferred depending on what peacekeeping operation you're looking at, but essentially in uh, those peacekeeping operations with robust mandates, which is the case in our five, our five biggest operation, we do have rules of engagement that uh, allow our peacekeepers to, to defend themselves. That's very clear uh, and, and certainly uh, uh, facing such an immediate threat as, uh, you know, one of the one you described. Um, and, and, and they do enable our peacekeepers to, to take some proactive actions. And again, if we want to protect ourselves, if we want to protect the population, then it, it, it's, it's also about being proactive. Wait, well, you're, to, you're talking about that, but I'm saying, does a peacekeeper have to wait to be shot at first before they react? No. If somebody points a gun at them, are they allowed to shoot them of before they, yes. they are shot? Yeah. Is it a yes or no question? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and the answer is yes. Matthew and Mr. Sato. Sure. Thank, <clears throat> thanks a lot. Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN <laughs> Closing for Access, thanks for the briefing. And hopefully you can uh, do stakeouts sometimes in the future when you brief the council. It would be helpful to get uh, as news is happening. I wanted to ask you about one of the proposed projects in the report about equipment, about um, night vision goggles, and it also talked about equipment to stop IEDs. And I, I'd, I'd heard, for example, in, in the Mali mission, that not that there, there's big disparities in what equipment different contingents have. Uh, that the Europeans, for example, deploy with goggles, drones, or a variety of self-protective equipment that is not available to the others that are there. And I'm wondering, as head of DPKO, do you think that's acceptable? Is there some way to sort of not necessarily bring down the level of security of the European troops, but to somehow bring up what's being done to bring up the level of security of, of the troops there? And in terms of human rights vetting, I wanted to know, just as one example, you know, in the, the, you have, there's more than a thousand Cameroonian uh, uh, peacekeepers that you have, and I'm sure some, many of them are, are, you know, perfectly vetted and fine. But in the last year, there have been attacks in the Anglophone areas of burning down whole towns. I mean, in the last weekend, an entire town was burned down by the Cameroonian army. And I'm just wondering, what's the speed with which DPKO figures out which units are involved in, in what seem to be human rights abuses and ensures that they're not deployed, you know, to spread these activities uh, to, to, for example, the CAO? Thanks a lot. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Uh, when it comes to equipment, um, I mean, first of all, we absolutely need to have all our contingent equipped, particularly with these uh, kind of life-saving equipment. And this is something uh, uh, on which uh, we're already working a lot. In Mali, uh, we have uh, uh, a great cooperation with UNMAS. Um, and uh, working with UNMAS, we have managed to reduce significantly uh, the uh, uh, the fatal incidents uh, resulting from IEDs. And it has to do with equipment, but it doesn't have to do only with equipment. It has to do very much also with how it is being used. In other words, you can have uh, a very good uh, vehicle and device to, uh, to blow up mines you know, before they uh, blow you out, but at the same time, you have to use it properly. You have to make sure that uh, if you have a, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going into the details just for you to understand, well, if we have uh, an armored car uh, you know, APCs, you have to be uh, in it and not on it, and you have to have your safety belt and your helmet. And if you do that, then uh, the chances that you will be killed as a result of the mine is much lower. And we saw that recently. We had a number of mine incidents in Mali over the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, fortunately, we only had two light injuries. I mentioned that to the Security Council the other day. So these mitigating measures together with making sure that contingents have the right equipment can uh, really save lives. Now, now, in terms of the vetting procedures, this is something that we uh, take very seriously. And I, uh, we, we, I think we vet like 8,000 people a month. Uh, um, we're happy to give you the right, the, the, the exact figure, but that, that's how much it is. And, uh, and there are certain uh, countries with um, human rights issues or, or issues in the past uh, uh, where we have special attention. Um, it takes more time, so we factor that in when we are, you know, potentially about to deploy contingents for these, from these countries. At the same time, uh, we want to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, whenever we 
uh, deploy a contingent, they, they have the problem of vetting. And if it takes extra work, you know, sort of more detailed work on specific units or on specific countries, then uh, we, we, we do it. Just one follow-up on that, on, on the vetting, because I'd heard, for example, Sri Lanka was, seems to be a country that had had some issues in the past, and they're now participating in peacekeeping. But I'd heard basically that it was one person in Geneva trying to see whether those who were being deployed were on the units that, were, that, 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 that took action in northern Sri Lanka. And it didn't seem mm -hmm. to be, many people there didn't feel that that's a big enough vetting. I mean, just in terms of staffing. How, how big is the staffing, and do you need more? Okay. Yeah, well, uh, I, I don't know, frankly, what, what is the staff, staffing in uh, uh, Geneva or THR. What I do know is that uh, in that particular case, that the vetting takes much more time uh, than uh, than it usually takes. Uh, so we're, we're doing it. Maybe we could do it more rapidly if we had more staff. I, uh, I agree with this, but uh, you know, we 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 want to make sure again that uh, uh, in the end, those units that will be deployed will will, will have be vetted properly. Mr. Sato, then Luke. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Fumitaka Sato from NHK. I have a two question. Uh, two questions, and one is uh, the last year there was a. Vancouver Declaration at uh, Canada. Uh, if you have any update on the uh, progress in terms of the, the especially preventing the children from the soldiers in the mission. And one more question is about Japan. Japan is still the, the major contributor to the uh, PKO. And besides the budget, do you have any specific ex expectation to Japanese contribution to PKO? <coughs> Um, we uh, on Vancouver. Uh, there, there were uh, there was a s statement Vancouver, and particularly on on the uh, children in uh, in armed conflict and uh, uh, and and children uh, child soldiers, uh, and this is something on which uh, many of our operations have been working uh, uh, for quite quite some time uh, through uh, reintegration programs, to disarmament programs, um, and. There are places like uh, Central African Republic, the DRC, where it really is uh, a major element in uh, in our efforts. Uh, so we definitely welcome the uh, statement in Vancouver because it's sort of re-energizing, it provided a new momentum to these uh, efforts. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, the Vancouver meeting, which is a meeting where ministers of defense meet to, uh, about peacekeeping, uh, is was very useful. These meetings are very useful. We uh, are getting more pledges, uh, which are really helpful to to fill our gaps. At the same time, um, I think uh, the time has come as well to take a second look of uh, 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 on, on what exactly we're getting in terms of pledges, and and and, and you know to what extent they uh, enable us to to fill the gap, and to 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 what extent also. The countries that are pledging units or troops uh, are ready to go to uh, the most dangerous places. So I'm putting this issue very frankly on the table. Uh, as far as Japan is concerned, I think um, I mentioned issues, challenges like training, you know, like pre-deployment control or visit, however we call them. Uh, I think we have a major effort to 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 make there to. Uh, we we obviously don't have, and the cruise report is very eloquent about that. We don't have enough in mission training. We don't do enough in terms of making our colleagues familiar with their environment. We we don't uh, uh, we we don't sir, we we probably have to improve also the way uh, troop contributing countries, police contributing countries train their troop at home. And sometime, let's face it, that would include not only peacekeeping training but just military training. Um, so we have to work on that, and uh, as you probably know, the, uh, uh, these efforts are largely, the training efforts are largely funded by uh, extra uh, voluntary funding, essentially. Over the last five years, our budget for training has been divided by two, and our training needs have been skyrocketing. If we want to do right what uh, we are planning to do, then we will need the support of countries like Japan, and I had a meeting with uh, uh, one of the high officials in uh, uh, Japan uh, uh, Prime Minister's office yesterday, we discussed that. Uh, and we will certainly be reaching out to countries like Japan and others who can help us in that regard. Uh, Marie, and then that'll have to be unfortunately the last question. 
Uh, Monsieur Lacroix, Marie Bourreau de RFI et du Monde. Um, I'd like to have the confirmation that this uh, Santa Cruz report has been financed by China. And if so, uh, what, what's the goal of China? <laughs> the, the China uh, uh, made a, a very important contribution, voluntary contribution. Uh, I think it was last year or two years ago, I don't remember. Uh, and I think it's a 10 years, uh, uh, you know, every year on, uh, throughout a 10 years period contribution to fund activities uh, that are uh, related to peace and security and to peacekeeping. Uh, so basically it's a, it's, it's a fund uh, that is uh, available for these activities to be, to be, to be funded uh, uh, if uh, it is deemed appropriate by the, the, f the, b the funds board, essentially. Uh, so, you know, the, this, uh, w when the, we took the initiative of, uh, of, uh, of the cruise report, then uh, we, we needed to, to uh, fund the uh, uh, cruise's uh, travel to the field and uh, his colleague as well. And, uh, and, and that fund was uh, basically happily provided us with the resources. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's basically, uh, and, and uh, we, uh, I should also make it clear that moving forward, we, we will need more colleagues to go to the field and make sure that we monitor the implementation and, and we, we, we will also need some support for, on this. I just want to uh, uh, add that uh, today, uh, you will be, uh, we will circulate um, uh, the, uh, a brief note about uh, a report that we, uh, uh, as a resulted from an investigation that we uh, initiated on a number of incidents related to uh, protection of civilians in the Central African Republic. Uh, there was a couple of incidents that occurred essentially between May and July in the Central African Republic resulted in the, in the, in the death of civilians and we, we wanted to know how we had performed. We asked a former force commander, General Moussou, to make that investigation. He came with a report and uh, we are now uh, you know, working on how to implement a recommendation and uh, you will uh, receive a note on, the, on this report later today. Um, I think it's important to uh, um, link what we're doing on the cruise report and uh, these kind of investigation. Basically, what we want to do is, whenever we think that uh, we need to properly investigate cases where we don't think performance in terms of protection civilian has been uh, perfect, then we do investigate. We do take the initiative of uh, uh, these investigation. And, uh, and most often, I mean, the recommendation that uh, come as a result of these reports are very similar to what we're seeing in uh, in the cruise report because they, they have to do with performance, they have to do with preparedness, understanding the mandate, I mean, all the things that I mentioned on the, uh, about the cruise report. So I just wanted to flag that as well. I'm sorry, he, uh, the Under Secretary General has to go. He's got a appointment 10 minutes ago. Um, thank you, Steph. You promise you'll be back. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.